Thank you all for coming. Um, so I'm going to be, as time said, talking about and designing playful objects. And uh, I, I hesitate a little to use the word object because I'm ultimately more interested in the kinds of experiences and relationships that they facilitate. But I'm also going to say object because I think especially here that's important because I do make physical things you can hold in your hands that aren't, you know, controllers. Um, so uh, I thought it'd be fun to start with this image. This is an object I made when I was eight years old. So it is a little paper Coke machine and I would hide behind it and people could insert their penny and then I would shoot the little paper sodas down the chute and stuff. So that uh, gives you a little sense of where I'm coming from. And throughout the talk, I'm gonna have some images, uh, kind of childhood things and you'll see kind of, it, it'll make sense. Um, yeah, so I'm gonna have kind of three main images I'm gonna keep coming, circling back to in this talk. Um, so I'll show them first now and then they'll kind of play out throughout the talk. The first is a uh, Renaissance wonder calmer. This is an old etching. Um, the next is a phylogenetic tree that shows evolutionary relationships. And the last is a photograph of my grandparents kissing in the 40s. So um, first I thought I'd give a little brief introduction to some of the things I make so that uh, it's a little more clear what I'm talking about. Um, a lot of them are kind of game-like or game-inspired without actually being uh, games per se. So like these are my recipe dice and you can roll a recipe. There's a little bit of a methodology to it. We have some suggested, you know, roll, sort, exclude a few, re-roll. Um, but the idea is to get, you know, playful with what you're cooking. Um, we also have a cocktail set. Um, this is my seed money. They're actual size paper coins embedded with seeds that you can plant. You can also leave them with your tip at the restaurant. Um, there's also, uh, this is a close-up, um, and they're, they're pretty fun. You can see they say, instead of in God we trust, they say in soil we trust, and there's some um, fun little details like that. Also, in the center there you can see there's an antique penny, and towards the top there's a Canadian penny, so there's, um, they're randomly mixed in because the way they they, everything fit on the printing plate, so maybe one out of 40 pennies is like a rare one. So as, you know, but, but not even every bag that people buy necessarily have one, so that's a little kind of treat hiding inside. Um, another uh, kind of quirky object with an experience, um, this little jar full of paper umbrellas comes with instructions to pass them out on a rainy street corner. Um, this, these are some old punch boards that I was inspired by to make an object. Um, these are kind of both gambling um, games and like party games, and you pop out through the holes, there's little scrolls, and you pop them out, a little paper comes out with like an assignment or a winning number. Um, and in this case, I kind of removed the game element from this object, and so my version ended up being more of a kind of a poem. And so this is a full moon theme one, and each full moon you punch one of the moons, and you get a little activity or thing to think about to kind of honor the moon. I'm gonna have you come here and catch this fly. Time, get ready, but don't kill it. Catch it. I'll tell you. I'll tell you when I'm really out of patience. Okay. Um, so this is, uh, these are my fortune teller napkins, so I don't know if you all remember making those little cootie catchers in elementary school, so this one's a little bit more of a sophisticated adult version with some kind of words of wisdom hiding inside. Um, let's see, so this is uh, another one that is, uh, I made this little sack out of my favorite shirt from college, and then I made a game of memory out of clothes tags, um, so how you play is you're trying to, I'm, <laughs> I don't know how you're gonna do it, but you know, I have a jar over there and a lid. Okay, so uh, you try to, the, the, the match is that the clothing item was made in the same country. So you're trying to turn over a made in China, a made in China, and then you get it. Um, so there's that. So um, this is, this is like a really, this is an image I keep coming back to for various reasons in my work. And I, um, right now, what I'm gonna talk about is, so all of those kind of toy-like, playful things I make, um, I like to ask like what they are in the service of. And they're in the service of like learning and connecting with people, and that's kind of like the win I'm aiming for. Um, and so this is a um, painting by Bosch, and this is The Conjurer is what it's called. So this guy's doing like a magic trick kind of thing, right? But actually what's going on is this guy is staring kind of, 
he's so he's so distracted that the guy behind him is stealing this little purse of money, right? Um, and then I want to, you know, that could be one approach to designing things, sort of playing to people's weak sides. Um, and then I want to contrast that with maybe, you know, this is kind of playful objects, but so is a tea ceremony. And thinking about what is that in the service of, and more a sense of sort of beauty and generosity, which is what I hope to do with the things that I make. Moving on to the first main image of the Wunderkammer. Uh, this is a curiosity cabinet from Renaissance Europe. And these are basically collections sort of pre-museum. And one of the things I love about them is that they combine like natural specimens, specimens with cultural artifacts. It's kind of before everything got categorized and everything gets to mix up. Um, and that's really an inspiration for how I think and work. Um, this is a great quotation that I think is very helpful. This book is actually about the Museum of Jurassic Technology, which many of you probably know about since it's right here. Um, but he talks about objects in Wunderkammern, and I'm just going to read the last half. He says, it wasn't just the artifacts that they displayed. It was how the palpable reality of such artifacts so vastly expanded the territory of the now readily conceivable. And that's kind of how I think of object making, is can I make something that when someone sees it or touches it or experiences it, their, their sense of what's possible really kind of opens up and changes. So here's a little um, quick run through some of the, the objects of my childhood that I think of as my own kind of personal wonder common of sorts. So this is a sea urchin shell from snorkeling with my father off the Southern California coast. Um, this is a giant game of chess that was in my grandparents' house when I was growing up. I have a couple of the pieces over here if you want to come hold them. They're weighty and wonderful. Um, also, frankly, watching Star Trek The Next Generation is how I got through middle school with my dad. And I think that that's, in many senses, a wonder common, all the kind of newness and, you know, things that, you know, that they weren't real new artifacts coming from exotic lands, but in an imaginary way, they also were. I think it did the same phenomenon. I'm a Montessori kid, and that, uh, that plays in. I'll come back to this image later. And uh, I had to include little Bazooka Joe comics. That's going to play in later, too, but I just thought they were really magical little treat of childhood. Okay, so, you know, you have the Wonder Power and all these kind of exotic things that are specifically in a context where you see them as unusual and strange. Um, but I want to also think about, I'm interested in how everyday things can have that same kind of phenomenon um, where we can kind of look around and see common things as just as magical and kind of sparking our imagination. Um, there's a, my favorite book is Pilgrim at Tinker Creek by Annie Dillard. And she has a wonderful passage where she's she's in a peach orchard and she's trying to, like this says, she's trying to unpeach the peaches, like kind of squint and look at them as if she didn't already know what they were. And that kind of opens up new possibilities for um, creative work and just experiencing the world in new ways. For me, instead of a peach, I'm playing with salt shakers a lot right now. Um, and I will get into more detail of that later. So uh, what all these objects have in common for me is largely a sense of the magic. Um, this sort of something coming from nothing or a hat being pulled, or, sorry, a rabbit being pulled out of a hat. A hat being pulled out of a rabbit would be even more exciting. Um, <laughs> uh, so I think one way to make magic is to kind of animate um, everyday things through creative structures. And that's like kind of rules and instructions for what to do with them. Um, friend Joe in the back will recognize this. Uh, so this is an activity from a lovely book. The activity is called 13 Walnuts, and I'll just read it real quick. Get 13 walnuts and place them in your local environment. Choose the locations for the walnuts with care, making each act of placing a walnut a gesture of good fit. Um, so we ran around Lake Merritt placing walnuts, and it was, it was a good time. Um, an example from my work of doing this is starting with something as simple as a colored pencil. And um, I made it sort of complicated in a way that I like to think uh, sort of reveals things about color in the world um, that we take for granted. So this was based on a product called 500 Colored Pencils, which already existed. It was actually, it's a subscription product. So you sign up and you get 20 colored pencils a month for a very long time. And then you finally have this epic collection of 500 pencils. 
the uh, and because they have 500, they you know they had to get really creative with the color names, which are pretty fun. Let's see a few of them. So I designed a project based on this. Um, 150 people signed up. I sent every month. Everyone got a pencil, a little packet in the mail. Everyone got a little journal, and then there was sort of a guide. You don't need to read this. It's just a, um, sort of a guide of how, how to play. And I did a little video at the beginning of each month. And people's assignment were, it was to take their pencil each month and um, design some sort of activity inspired by that color or the name of the color or both. And then they would document it in their journal with the pencil. Um, I'll read. I'll read Russian Sea because it's really fun. This is one. These are some that were submitted. Um, the beach in January is no place for the same. Yet here I was in Brooklyn's Renaissance. Ah, sorry. In Brooklyn's Russian enclave of Brighton Beach. The smells of bakeries mingled with the sharp, salty Atlantic air, and English mingled with Russia, Russian on the tongues of the locals, mostly elderly. They lend weight to the phrase, the old country. Most were bundled tightly in fur coats and sable hats, smelling of tobacco. A few brave souls were swimming in the ocean on a 45 degree January day. The brilliant sun and the cloudless sky silhouetted them as their speedo clad loins dipped into this Russian sea. And I felt that they were remembering that even Siberia has beaches, cold though they are. I sipped vodka, listened to Goho Cordello, and watched the January swimmers in the Russian sea. The, uh, another participant who got mahogany went to her uh, local furniture store and asked for a tour of everything that was made out of mahogany. Um, the, let's see, I'm gonna go ahead. Uh, some of the things this project inspired me to do, one of my pencils, I ended up um, place, like sort of placing buttons made out of shell on the beach. Um, when I got Lucy a pink pencil, I remembered one of my favorite scenes um, from I Love Lucy, and I bought myself a fancy chocolate truffle. Um, so this is just a little screenshot of the blog that goes with the project, so everybody could see what else um, was being done when the journal entries came in. I scanned them and posted them. So it's kind of neat because you could pick on a color, and six other people would have that same color, and you could see how they responded, um, responded differently. Okay, so that kind of wraps up the Wonder Hammer. Um, I'm going to move on to the second main image, and these three images are just to kind of like, my process is very intuitive, maybe you can tell by my talk too, and so I'm trying, I tried to kind of pick some images that I thought would tease out some of my working assumptions behind what I do, with the idea being that maybe there are like tools and lessons learned in there. Um, so this is an image I find really striking and interesting. So a phylogenetic tree, like I said earlier, it shows the sort of branching of different species through evolution, and you can see their common ancestors and um, you know, around the edge, and this is actually part of a bigger circle, you see the, the vast diversity that nature sort of proliferates into. And I think this is a good working metaphor for how I work when I sit down and I brainstorm and I'm trying to design things. It's sort of like I'm traveling up, up these different routes. Um, and I think it actually, so I was thinking about that, and then I think maybe an arborescent shape or pattern isn't actually quite right. And so I think looking at complex network, Patterns is even maybe more useful, which uh, reminded me of, um, this is a sketch I did a few years ago that actually kind of forked and branched and went lots of different ways. And so I'm gonna talk through that as an example of this kind of speciation way of thinking of uh, creating a sort of creative process or coming up with ideas and developing them. So this little sketch is just, this is just me playing with kind of relationships, poetic relationships between everyday objects, because those are what I seem to be obsessed with. Um, and one way this went was um, not quite a game, more of an activity, and, but it was, you know, there were kind of rules, instructions, and you play, and how it works is, um, so this would be four players, and you, your, your hand, instead of a hand of cards, you have your little set of objects. And you take turns placing an object into an empty circle, and whatever other objects it's connected to with dashed lines, you say out loud some sort of creative relationship that you see between them. And the criteria for that relation is totally up, totally up to whatever. It can be they spark a memory, it could be they're both red, it could be you know wordplay based that they remind you of some weird theory, anything. Um, and so these are the kind of fun to see the collection of objects and some of the stuff I have up here if you want to come take a look afterwards. 
Um, a couple example plays. So like you might play the dinosaur connected to the life game car because um, cars are powered by gas and gas is deep underground like dinosaur bones. Or uh, maybe I'll jump to the last one. Like maybe you connect a home key to a compass because you might need a compass to find your way home. When you get there, you might need a key to unlock the door. Um, so that's how it started. It's really kind of, um, my mom likes to say that I designed Montessori activities for adults. Um, so it's kind of like that. It wasn't really a game. It was just like you do this thing and it's you know, inherently valuable and interesting. So it started there and then like these are a couple like little branches. I ended up making a hat version in case you want to play on the go. I ended up making a really big version for um, when I was a guest at a museum so that a lot of people could play at once, more people. Um, So it started as this activity, and then what happened was it, uh, my editor at Chronicle Books, who I do some projects with, she saw it, she's like, ooh, let's make a game, like a game game. And so I was super excited, and we turned it into a game, and then after I signed the contract, she's like, actually, can you come up with a competitive version? And I was like, oh, no. You know, but um, what that inspired was, what we actually ended up doing was two versions. Um, and this game just came, just came out three weeks ago, and it has the activity version and the competitive version. Um, and I'm, I'm actually kind of delighted to say that once given the task of a competitive version, I won't go into all the details now, but um, I was able to come up with a way that I think actually encouraged creative thinking and sharing of interesting things, and as such, I'm like, okay with that, that's cool. <laughs> So back to kind of these images for this section. We've got the branching and the networks. And when I'm thinking about working, I almost think it's helpful to kind of like think of myself as like like down in there in the little node and I'm like navigating with a compass, you know, and kind of moving around and like what's over here and what's going on over here. Um, and I actually tried to uh, I tried to kind of diagram this out a little bit. This is, you know, this is, I think this is actually like a simple version of what's kind of going on under the surface when I'm working, but I was trying to kind of figure out like, where did all this stuff come from? Um, so the Infinite Possibilities game kind of, I put a big question mark there because I was trying to go back to the beginning and I was like, I don't know where the beginning is, but another thing that ended up coming off of that was um, the work I'm doing with Salt which I'll share a little bit about. Um, it's also about, you know, it's a playful object. This one is more of a poem than an activity, or sorry, more of a poem than like a game, um, but it's still interactive. I sit across, this is, um, I'm sort of the host and the guest sits across from me, and um, I write out I write, I write out text in salt grains, and this is actually Braille, and my kind of guest that comes gets to read it with their finger. And there's kind of some, some instructions, but they also, um, it's not super scripted, there's some interactivity. And at one point, so, so this actually says, um, these are actually stars, which they learn along the way. And at one point I just end up like dumping, dumping, dumping salt, because I'm trying to dump as many grains of salt as there are stars in the universe, and then it gets really ridiculous, but that's part of it. Um, and then this is actually, so this totally looks like salt, right? This is actually a globular cluster, a photo of stars. Um, it, it totally looks like that, which is fun. Uh, let's see, so I was trying to figure out kind of where all this came from, and I remembered um, some other, it all started by this passage I read in a Barry Lopez book where he talks about laying on the beach and feeling the sand as if they were, um, as if they were braille, the grains of sand. And this is a little piece about this big that I just cut out little circles of sandpaper and I transcribed that um, passage from the book. I actually sent this to Barry Lopez. He was very thankful to send me a thank you. Um, I've also done a little play work with braille. And I think that my interest in kind of the tactile, you know, braille salt stuff like, it's even fair to say that it goes back to holding sea urchins with my dad, and that's kind of interesting to think about. Um, so, so I think of, I think of these things as sort of other branches on that um, on that evolutionary tree, and then in terms of a network diagram, I think there's a bunch of other things that play into some of this kind of salt poetry performance work. You know, things like theater, where there's 
there's a, kind of a performance in an audience, even though my audience is very small, or maybe the tea ceremony again, which is about generosity and poetry. Um, even my Montessori preschool activities where I'm, you know, you're, you're learning by moving around these beautiful wooden objects with your hands. Um, magic tricks, more playful objects, right, but the sort of, I'm not dealing in perception tricks, more kind of poetry, I guess, but it's a similar aesthetic. Um, and I've always loved Joseph Cornell's work, but I also, um, like when I see this, like I want to like go in and touch it and you know start playing with all the objects, right? So that's that's what I do in my work. Um, and of course, because there's salt, it, it comes back to Star Trek, which a lot of things do in my life. Um, yeah. Okay. So the, my last little note about the the kind of tree and network system stuff is I wanted to just touch briefly on this 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 kind of excessive proliferation that I think nature does. Um, and I think that's a really good model for how to think creatively and develop things. And, you know, balance with that, like, I think I kind of just sit down and explode, kind of like a dandelion, you know, blossom, and then you just sit down and kind of collect those little things and be like, and, and bring in the critical mind and figure out which ones are really, um, you know, most interesting or most useful or kind of connect back around to your ultimate goals. Um, so one example of this kind of proliferation, so to go back to the clothes tag game, so I also did a, uh, a clothes tag, and this is an actual size clothes tag that I had produced, and it has symbols and words that sort of honor the people and places behind the production of clothing, and how this worked was it was actually a tag exchange, so people could cut a tag off of their shirt and send it to me in the mail, and then I would send them one of my tags in exchange, and the idea was that they could sew it in place and just kind of live with that as a consciousness raising thing. Um, and then another variation on that on that theme is I wove a giant reproduction of one of my clothes tags on my loom from local wool. There's that, and sometimes um, when it, so sometimes this is in an exhibit space and this tag exchange uh, takes place there, and usually there's a world map, so when people cut theirs off, they can pin it to the place of origin, which is cool too. Um, okay, one more kind of proliferation story. So this is a knitting pattern I developed called Sky Scarf. And what you do is you collect balls of yarn that correspond to uh, the different weather colors, so blues and grays and whites, and then each day, you add one thin stripe to the scarf that kind of embodies uh, that day's weather, what the sky looks like. So after a year, you have a one-year weather report in the length of a five-foot scarf. And I um, put together a kit that people can buy to make this really easy to participate. I have a Flickr pool where there's like hundreds of photos people have uploaded, which is really fun, especially for the sky scarf because they look so different in different climates. Um, so then. You know, I, of course I didn't stop here though because I'm exploding dandelion and so I did um, a mood scarf where you track your mood each day and it's sort of to cultivate self-awareness. There's also one that's a subway scarf and you get colors of yarn that correspond to the different, um, different lines and when you switch lines you switch colors while you're knitting on the subway. Okay, so... You know, I make this map, like, I, I do all this kind of intuitively, but I think it's helpful to make a map, because then I think it, it maybe it helps to identify blind spots and kind of places where you could go that you're not going. And one example I have of that is, so this is um, just a little piece kind of like the sandpaper one. These are mustard seeds glued onto paper in Braille. And I was looking at this the other day thinking, like, you know, what would between that and the salt thing, and it's this insight of, like, no glue, right? Like, the glue seemed, like, so important at the time that I made this. Like, why couldn't I see to get rid of the glue and make things move? But, you know, maybe if I had drawn up a diagram and there was something connecting this with, you know, the concept of movement or the body or performance, it would have been very obvious, like, ditch the glue, and that's, like, the next step. So I'm kind of curious. This is That's something new I'm thinking about, is trying to map stuff out more and be a little more conscious of the process. Um, but I'm kind of interested in that. Okay, so the last main image is one of my grandparents kissing in the 1940s. And uh, I bring this in because I want to talk about the romance of creative work. And um, my, my grandparents have a lovely story. So this, is, this photo is after World War II. Um, he'd recently come home. Uh, 
my grandparents met in fifth grade. They were assigned locker number 16 and 17. And uh, they later ended up buying a house and the address was 1617, which is kind of crazy. But anyway, footnote. Um, and you know, my, my grandfather went off to World War II at age 18. My grandmother wrote him a letter every single day and knit socks and sent them. And they just have a very inspiring love story to me. Um, and I, I think this is useful for creative work because I feel like I'm on the right track if I feel like I'm falling in love while I'm working. And um, it's sort of like thinking about how I'm navigating through that bubble diagram or those kind of rivers is like just kind of paying really close attention and you know following following your heart in a way. But, not but that doesn't necessarily mean like following your passion or your joy. It's like it's not always fun. It can be very difficult. But to kind of pay attention to the things that really spark your imagination and kind of reach out and grab you and try to make sense of them and like go there, um, which I think romance re romantic relationships can feel a lot like that as well. Um, this is a this is an old dance card from a. Uh, Valentine's Day 1941. This is in my grandmother's scrapbook. And you can you can see she has little notes in the in the heart space about my grandfather, which is fun. And I bring this in because uh, again, kind of like the compass in navigating, I want to sort of propose that maybe the process I'm talking about is also a lot like dancing. Um, so here's a little dance diagram and um, I think it's fun to kind of think about the resonances in these shapes too. To kind of think about, you know, as I'm navigating this, like kind of getting into a bubble and doing a dance, or with an idea, or sometimes with a person, a collaborator. Um, sometimes it is actually like a romantic thing, and I'm actually trying to court a man, and that leads to something. So I'll give an example of one of those. It's kind of fun. Um, so rainbow chalk, very simple. Rainbow chalk plus an elaborate plan, less simple. And uh, what I ended up doing was. I got up at like five in the morning and I got a bag with all this chalk and then I took a, a poem that I knew this man would like um, and I, I made a hopscotch for each stanza in the poem. So each stanza ended up taking up like maybe 20 feet and then I spread out like 10, 10 hopscotches over a course of a mile and a half between his front door and a rose garden. This is in Oakland. And um, so between each hopscotch, there was like arrows basically like go this way or turn this corner. But so he basically ended up hopping the entire poem to the rose garden, at which point he called me and said that it was the nicest thing anyone had ever done for him, which was kind of awesome. It didn't work out, but we're really good friends. It's all good. <laughs> That's the story of my life. Um, so <laughs> It's okay, as long as you get some good art out of it, it makes it feel better. So, uh, so that's one example. And then also this sense of dancing, like even with the salt stuff, this is one that I made for my friend Charlie. And uh, you can see the, the, so I like to do these as like customized ones too. Um, so this is the back of that little salt packet that he got to take home. So his little braille salt said, and he's a chef, so it says, take it in with all of your senses down to the very last tiny bit. Um, and this was actually fun because I didn't, uh, I, I'd done these before with other people, but he's a chef, right? But I totally didn't expect he would like, he like actually ate it as he read it, which is pretty great. I was like, oh, of course, like I should have, I should have anticipated that. That should have been part of, you know, but. But what's nice about these is that they're so open that they allow for that kind of that kind of play. Um, another, uh, this one is a little less personal. I think of this project as kind of da a dance with strangers, perhaps. Um, this is a book I just did with with Chronicle Books that came out a few months ago called My Museum, and it's uh, in the in the category of books called guided journals. So it's basically a um, empty museum with frames, display cases pedestals and the idea is that you you fill it with with things that are meaningful and interesting to you um, be they real or imaginary or you know what have you um, so so there's my my dancing and then another thing about I'm gonna go through like a few more kind of aspects of romance that I think are applicable to creative work so I think another one is being being bold which you know we get to come back here of course for being bold because um, I think that romance makes people do really crazy stuff 
but that's actually really great and like maybe creative work should do that too more often um, I don't know how you make that happen exactly but um, here's one example of something I did I was part of a larger um, project in San Francisco where there were a bunch of us as street peddlers on uh, Market Street and I was the city seeds woman so I made this skirt out of uh, seed packets and I wore a you know seed starter planter thing on my head and I was walking down Market Street singing and it was terrifying so this is and I know this isn't like a big deal for a lot of people but for me this is really scary big deal so um, that's my example of being one example of being bold but it pays off in the end because it was a good time um, and being bold I'm also going to talk about my uh, world's smallest post service um, which is basically a teeny tiny letter transcription service. So people write letters, I turn them into tiny versions, and I send them off. But it started, it makes sense, right? But it started as a kind of more bold, weird thing. Um, I sewed myself a postal uniform, uh, added a little stripes and a patch, and then I biked down to bakery, and I set up my tiny post office. Um, people stopped by, and uh, I have a little American Girl doll desk that I write on, and a little birthday candle to do the wax seals. And so people would write a letter, I would rewrite it for them. Um, they look, end up looking pretty much like this. There's a tiny stamp and everything. Um, and this, uh, just a little side note about you know the, the magic we were talking about earlier and thinking about the um, the Bazooka Joe comic, and like. What I love about this is it's like this tiny little scrap of paper. It's like almost nothing, right? But it's like so much. And I, I think that the way it's kind of concentrating content is really um, calls attention and it really means a lot to people in a way. It really matters what you say when you send one of these to someone because it's kind of, it's packaged so magically. It's like the words better be good, you know? <laughs> um, and I send them with a magnifying glass to help read them. Um, this is a customer, my customers just send me really nice photos sometimes, they're like, look, I love my letter, and this is really awesome to see. Um, uh, you know, I've done tons of Valentines, and uh, marriage proposals, and tooth fairy letters, and, uh, you know, I've, I've sent quite a few to um, military people abroad. Um, one of my favorites was one from a man, a uh, Mother's Day card to his mother where he talked about the, the small things and how many carrots she chopped for his school lunches when he was growing up. Um, this is another customer photo of, um, he, her, her husband had gotten a tiny letter for her to open at the hospital when she had, uh, her baby. So... So for me, that was a bold thing to do, and you know, there's no guarantee it's going to work out. In this case, like I've sent over 10,000 tiny letters now, and that's you know, I quit my day job and started paying rent with tiny, not tiny money, but tiny letter money, um, and it worked. But I guess I also want to say that I think it's also really important to you know, there's other things I do that are bolder.